CityCast from Explicity. I felt my cheeks flush. I never saw a woman wearing trousers before. She laughed. Well, I won't be the last. You can take that to the bank, she said. Then, agile as a cat, she climbed to the open top, straddled the plank between the giraffe's traveling rooms, and grinned down at me as if to say, what are you waiting for? My head all but swiveled off looking back at the old man's hut. His rumbling snores were still going strong, so stiffening my spine, up I went. As I eased down on the plank facing her, the giraffes pulled in their heads from their windows and surrounded us in the open air, their snouts bumping our knees. Girl butted me so hard looking for onions, I had to grab her big head to stay upright. Red, meanwhile, had touched one of boy's horns and got baptized with giraffe slobber, which would have sent most women screaming for the ground, but not Red. Laughing again, she wiped at her face and silky shirt with one hand, patting boy's big jaw with the other, and as her pats turned to soft strokes, the whole of her seemed to unwind. I'm touching a giraffe. She sighed a sigh so full of reverie I thought she might float away. They fill me up with wonder just looking at them. I see Africa's biggest day. I see all the wonders of the world waiting out there to be seen, she said, giving me a look of such unbridled, overflowing joy. I thought she was going to kiss me. Even though I'd spent every night at the depot imagining how I'd kiss Augusta Red, it scared the bejesus out of me. If girl hadn't picked that exact moment to butt me sideways, I would have found out. Instead, Red turned all that feeling toward Wild Boy, her soft strokes turning into glorious caresses. They are hard to believe, aren't they? Trying to keep from going to complete mush watching her caress Boy, I scrambled for something, anything to say, and heard one of the old man's warnings come out of my mouth. Careful, big don't know from small. Boy licked at the air as Red kept on caressing. They're not that dangerous, are they? She asked. Right then, girl's huge head thumped me again. They can crack a lion's skull with a kick of their hooves, I said, grunting as I tightened my hold. Red paused. You've seen them kick? Seen this one, I said, nodding at girl, who now had her snout all but in my pocket. She's whopped the old man, but not like she wants to send him to kingdom come. Not yet, anyway. So, she's feisty. Good. Red reached over to pat her. She looked back at boy. But this one's a gentleman, isn't he? He answered by sticking his snout in Red's crotch, which had her squirming and me this side of bopping him for his bad manners. As he looked up, all giraffe innocence, she laughed again. A gentleman rascal, even better. And she went right back to her reverie, brushing her fingers over a diamond-shaped spot on the wild boy's jaw, as if she didn't quite believe it was there. Then her voice turned soft, dreamy. Did you know that you're not the first to take a giraffe across the country? About a hundred years ago, the ruler of Egypt sent one to the king of France. They sailed it over on a boat and walked it the 500 miles to Paris. Can you imagine? She went on softer, dreamier. The whole country went crazy for it. Women wearing piled up giraffe hairstyles, men wearing tall giraffe hats. They say a hundred thousand people lined the streets and watched in awe as the royal cavalry escorted the giraffe to the king's palace. She moved her hand down the wild boy's neck, and boy shuddered with delight. And hundreds of years before that, an Egyptian sultan sent one to Florence. It's actually in frescoes and paintings, roaming the town's squares and gardens. There's even a constellation named after it, she glanced up at the stars. They say you can see it in the northern Mexican sky. Maybe we'll be able to see it in the desert. Then she sighed again. This time so quiet I almost missed it. And I really, really didn't want to miss it. Boy began chewing his cut again, and girl gave up her onion hunt to do the same. 
leaving drool all over my new duds. Wiping at the slobber, I said to Red, You sure know a lot about giraffes. When I looked back, Red was gazing at the giraffe the same way the old man did. They're so full of everything I've never done or seen except in books that they might as well have floated down to earth from that hole in the sky, blown to earth by a hurricane to land in front of me. When I saw them, I knew exactly what I had to do. With that, she reached to touch both giraffes one last time, then jumped down to the ground before I had a chance to help her. It is said that you don't rescue dogs, they rescue you. This saying reflects the connection that we have with our pets, especially dogs who are said to have had a special relationship with human beings for thousands of years. So when we adopt dogs, we think we're giving them a new lease on life. But in reality, they give us so much more in return. Joy, comfort, companionship, and a sense of purpose. They make us better human beings. This idea of animals rescuing humans is the central theme in my guest, Linda Rutledge's brilliant novel, West with Giraffes. The book follows the journey of Woodrow Wilson Nickel, or Woody, a 17-year-old boy who drove two giraffes cross-country from New York to the San Diego Zoo. This novel is based on a true story, events that happened in 1938. The two giraffes survived high seas, a storm on the high seas, which almost killed them. Then they needed to be transported to the San Diego Zoo, so they were loaded on the back of a truck with nothing of the sophisticated methods of animal transportation that we have today. And they embarked on a 13-day journey across the U.S. in this rig. As Woody and his traveling companion, the old man Riley, navigate the challenges of the journey, the giraffes become not just Woody's companions, but his teachers, showing him the beauty and the grace of life. Through things that happen on the road, Linda Rutledge crafts the transformation of Woody from a callow teenager to a complete human being, a man, through stories of danger, romance, and above all, self realization. What strikes me about West with Giraffes is how it channels the classic American novel style of writing and storytelling. This book is a literary gem that will have you feeling like you're living in 1938 America. The parallels with Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird are impossible to ignore. Both novels explore themes of coming of age, social injustice, and the power of empathy all set against the backdrop of a rapidly changing America. It's 1938, and Hitler was looming large on the horizon. While modern writing often reflects the times in which we live and the technology that we use, Linda Rutledge proves in this novel that she has the ability to carry forward the tradition of great American authors, like Harper Lee, Steinbeck, Mark Twain. And these are comparisons that I do not drop lightly. Her prose is just as vivid and compelling. And now, here she is, joining me from her home in Austin, Texas, Linda Rutledge. Welcome to the Literary City. Oh, thanks so much for having me. This is marvelous. Well, I'm happy to have discovered you. Let's start with your book, West with Giraffes. It's a fictionalized account, as I described in my monologue, correct? Exactly right. It really is a true story. And how did you come to research and fictionalize it? Oh, I, I was just about to say, of course, I you know, made it into fiction because uh, all I had was the um, thir about 30 news clippings that I had uncovered when I was doing the history of the San Diego Zoo. I was writing that, that, um, that book for them, and um, I kept thinking how what an amazing story. I mean, they're all amazing stories there, as you might imagine, but this one was, was over the top, and all I had to work with were 30 yellowed clippings from 1938. And um, I just, um, when I read about the hurricane, I just thought this was, this, this could be something better. Then I looked for a diary by the man who uh, did the feat. I found nothing, of course, because uh, the zookeepers at that time were, were not the kind of guys who wrote in diaries. 
And this would be Riley, correct? Riley, yeah, exactly. Riley is based on a real man named Charlie Smith. That character and, uh, doesn't was, seem the diary keeping sort. <laughs> That's exactly what I meant, yes. And uh, so essentially, um, uh, I had to give that up for a little while. And uh, in the meantime, um, I decided, started thinking about um, the fact that it could be a piece of fiction. But if it, if I did try that, I would have to create um, all sorts of characters to go with it, and they would have to be uh, pretty interesting. And, and I'm, um, I, I found that they were because, of course, I created them, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I made them even more as I went. <laughs> so there you go. What were you doing when you found those 30 news uh, clips, clippings? Well, um, I'll try to give you the short story of it, but um, of course, I'm a novelist, because so that will never happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, I the um, I would tell this in the author's note at the end of the book, uh, but um, what happened was I and I, this is really a twenty year saga in some ways. Uh, in 1999, I happened to be in, found myself in San Diego, and I fell into a book project at the time. Uh, another kind of book project, an earlier one, um, about one of their directors. And um, I uh, happened to be looking all around for clippings, and I looked through the 1938 scrapbook for some reason. And you have to get a picture of this scrapbook. We're talking about it falling apart, of course. It was 1938. Wow. And, but that's all they did back then. They had a something called a you know, news service news clipping services. Oh, yeah, very popular. And, um, and, okay, there you go. And back then, you know, if you, if you got your name, if the San Diego Zoo got their name in the paper, then anywhere in the country or even in the world, uh, they would get a clipping of it. So the volunteers then would put them into, um, you know, into the scrapbooks. And they're just falling apart, these, yellow, these old yellow scrapbooks. And so, but I couldn't resist and I was, it was actually writing about something in 1950, but I just couldn't resist these old clippings. And I uncovered them back then. I uncovered the story, and I was, again, amazed. I'm, I'm a late bloomer, so essentially I didn't settle down to start writing um, until just in the last 20 years. So w when was this that you were in uh, San Diego and you found these clippings? Which year was that? That was 1999. And when did the book get published? Well, this was 2020, 2020. What happened in between? What happened was um, during that time in the middle, I, of course, ended up being asked to write the history of the San Diego Zoo. Ah. And um, so from 2012 to 2016, I went back to San Diego and uh, did all this research again and revisited all of these clippings. And by, and by that time, I, I was a published novelist. So I began thinking. Why couldn't if I if why couldn't I create a, a, a fiction and fictionalized characters around uh, this story to fill in the gaps that uh, I didn't have from the nonfiction story I had? So I started slowly creating this. I would write the, the history of the San Diego Zoo during the day, and then I would you know work on my work at night on this fun project uh, with on a whiteboard trying to figure out what was happening, when it was happening, and I, you know, and it was great fun, as you might imagine. Whiteboard with an events timeline? You mean like the cops used to uh, solve murders in the TV shows? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> uh, no, actually, I've been, uh, when I do my do speaking for this book, I, have sh I, I usually show this picture of, this, of the whiteboard, and um, I actually created... Um, the uh, road trip mm -hmm. from uh, New York to San Diego. Right. And I then had to figure out what was going to happen when in each state. And, uh, and I began uh, cr creating uh, the characters. I had uh, what, who, which characters were going to do what, uh, what were the ones that had to be totally fictional and which ones, which ones could be based on uh, real characters. It was, Again, quite fun, but it took quite a while. And did you write the story that you set out to write? Were you fulfilled? In fact, um, one reader uh, wrote me to ask me how did I manage to write a historical novel, a social and political commentary, let's see, and a coming-of-age story and a love story 
all in one book. I agree. And my answer has always been, well, I had a lot to work with and I had the time of my life creating it. It was marvelous. It shows. It's a wonderful book. Oh my, thanks. And there's so much humanity that comes through in the book. So, is this book more about humans than giraffes? <laughs> yes and no. You know, I have to say, uh, I wanted to make, a I wanted to, to comment on, on the fact that you know we're have, we're living in during a sixth extinction now, and it's this is really uh, my consciousness was quite raised while I was working with the San Diego Zoo uh, during the um, the last you know twenty years, but mostly in the last uh, in uh, when I was writing this book. Um, that we are in this age of ex extinctions. I mean, uh, incredible extinctions. And, and um, you know, there, the um, giraffe itself is, is, is quite threatened. Uh, and it's because, you know, we have uh, far too many people in the world. Uh, and that's, that's just the way it is. And we're encroaching on their, their natural habitats. Um, and I had heard a conservation writer say just about the same time I was starting to write this, that um, that he, he and this is a quote. He said, "Storytelling matters. Imagination has become an ecological force." So I thought to myself, "Well, why can't I do everything? Why can't I do both? Why can't I talk about well what it was like to live back then, especially for for women and for African Americans, certainly, um, and what in." And have it have great fun writing about that and making statements about that. But why couldn't I also try to say something about the giraffes themselves too? I saw that you juxtaposed the character of the giraffes, stoic, mature, honorable, against the rather coarse and gritty humans in your story. And I thought that you crafted that contrast extremely well. Oh, well, thank you. That was my intent. Let's just, I, I really felt animals can make us better humans and, and they make us more human and in the best sense of the word. And, uh, and that was uh, quite fun to create because I felt it deeply that that's probably what happens. This subtle human foible is not new to you, is it? I found that in your first novel, uh, Faith, what's it called? Faith Darling's Garage Sale? Faith, Faith, yes, Faith, ba Faith, it's a long one. Faith Bass Darling's Last Garage Sale. Faith yes. Bass Darling's Last Garage Sale, right. Thank yes. you. Yes. Uh, it's about this uh, woman, uh, this heiress, who has an epiphany and then sells everything she owns cheaply in a garage sale. What a lovely premise, I thought. <laughs> you know, I haven't read your style of writing and the narrative the prose that you employ for a very long time. And by that, I mean, your writing is more uh, evocative of the classics. I know we discussed this off the air and you asked me a question about why I said what I said. I couldn't articulate it at the time. But then I realized what I'm trying to say is that there's a big difference between the latter day, the more, the more modern writers in America and the ones that came before. Now, the classic American tradition, uh, American writers haven't been very self-referential, if you know what I'm saying. Even if it's writing in the first person, they try not to make it about themselves, but more about what they're trying to say. That makes sense. Right? That does make sense, yes. And your literary style, therefore, I'm saying, is classic. See, you don't make it all about yourself, but many of the younger writers do. Ah, Yes. Uh, well, I have to say, uh, part of it is that, of course, you're, you know, outing me about my age, probably, because uh, I think uh, I have a lot of, um, I have a lot of, I've done, I've lived a lot. And therefore, um, I also have uh, all these literature degrees. And, and I, and I, I kind of cut my teeth on all, on all the American and English uh uh, literary uh, figures and, and books uh, oh, all through the years. And I was just sort of waiting to, for a chance for the right thing to come along so that I can throw myself into it. Now, I think you're, you're exactly correct about a self-referential sort of uh, writing uh, and how things have changed. As, I, as you might imagine, I can also see the changes across, you know, having studied this too, the changes that, that happen each, for each decade. But what you what you kind of also notice is that um, what shakes out what what is it that shakes out 
and lasts. And I believe what you're really uh, seeing is um, what will happen. I'm just guessing in the future is that that, that these books, the books that we it seem very self-referential right now, probably won't make it into the into the canon. Yes, I agree. I'm saying they might. Mm -hmm. A few of them might. Right. And they might. But but essentially, the things that we that we see as classics now. Mm -hmm. Well, they were also surrounded by all kinds of other kind of writing. And we just have, we weren't living through that time. So what we saw, what we have seen, what would have shakes out is we're just the classics. Makes sense. And um, I'm, you know, I can, and I, so I can see what you're saying. And I can also uh, just also see probably what the future will be for that. And, you know, I would be a very happy little camper if I, if I had thought that, that um, any of my writing could be anywhere near uh, the canon at that time. How can you not be in the canon when you have opening lines like this one from Faith Bass Darling's last garage sale? On the last day of the millennium, after a revelation from God, Faith Bass Darling had a garage sale. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I promise this cuts across cultures. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And you've been a travel writer. When you when you write and when you were researching this book with those 30 news clippings, was there a movie that was playing in your head? <laughs> exactly. Oh, I'm I am the, I'm definitely of the TV generation. You know, I grew up with TV. Yes. I, I mean, I, there's always a movie going on in my head. I I'm also really visual. I'm very very visual and um and so if I can't my my writing process cre is essentially I need to be able to see it before I can write it, and um, I will imagine what, and then the words come. I imagine what is going to happen, and then I try to turn even the words on their on their heads to make it a different kind of thing. You know, um, this this is why it takes years to write. Usually it takes me years to write a book because I'm constantly changing everything, but um, or, or the nuance anyway. I'm changing the nuance of everything because I don't want to have. Um, I want to spoil anybody's expectations. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> I want to keep surprising you. A lot of quotable moments in your book. Let's look at a few. Oh, here's one I liked. Climbing up, I leaned as far back as I could on the mountainside of the teetering rig and started calling to the giraffes without a single onion to help. <laughs> you know, I quite like the pace that you maintain right through the book. And uh, you mentioned TV. This is like a fantastic reality show. You know, I, I was engaged. Yay, they've reached Tennessee. <laughs> that was the idea. A lot of subtle humor. That can just slip under you if you aren't looking. Like this one, I'd walk a mile for a camel. <laughs> and this one must be something of a private joke, right? As they're setting off for the journey. Don't take any wooden nickels, a cop yells. Too late, the old man yells, cutting his eye at me. Well, now. <laughs> wooden nickels? Woody nickel? Yes, that's his name. So I'm surprised that you, uh, and I'm, I'll be surprised um, if um, you know, no, if any um, non-Americans will get that because anybody under thirty, any, any American, you know, kid, anybody under thirty here is probably not going to have heard that. I heard that phrase uh, growing up in westerns. Oh, see, yes, yes, that's right. See, there you go. So, are you naturally funny, or is it? Something that you employ as a as part of your craft. Um, I, I someone told me my style was humorously serious, nice. and I like that so much because, in my view, a good story, the kind that stays with you and gives you food for thought, it it packs a velvet punch. Hmm. So it has to have some gravitas to it, but it should be but it should be delivered lightly and with a kind of a dash of joy. Velvet punch, delivered lightly, dash of joy. You see, these are phrases that I wouldn't immediately employ to uh, describe some of the new writers. Again, back to that whole self-referential thing. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> you have a new book coming out. When? Uh, 
Yeah, well, in February um, 2024, next this this time next year, supposedly. We're just now in edits. And when it's released, come back on the show. Let's talk some more. Oh, marvelous. Yes, that would be wonderful. It would. And I'd look forward to that. Linda Rutledge, thank you so much for being my guest today on The Literary City. Well, it's been terrific. You've been marvelous. Thank you. And you do a really fine job. You're too kind. It was wonderful talking to you. That was Linda Rutledge, author of West with Giraffes, a book that has been translated into over a dozen languages. There's a link in the podcast description to where you can buy the book. And I'll be back with that fun segment, What's That Word?, where we look at words and phrases that we use all the time but never stop to think about. Right after this. I'm back with What's That Word? And here she is, my co-host. Hello. My name is Pranati, but you can call me P. That's P with an A, not another E. P with an A. Are you ready for another adventure in philology today? Yes, indeed. But isn't that the study of language? Yeah, it is. History, development, usage. Why? And what's the story of words called? Uh, the study of words specifically? Lexicology. I thought so. So which one would that make us? Philology or lexicology? Well, they're closely related. You see, lexicology is the study of words within a language. You know, individual words and how these words relate to each other. As I said, within a language. Okay. But philology, on the other hand, is the study of languages in its um, historical context. You know, it... While it includes the study of specific words, it's about structure, grammar, social, cultural, context, etc., etc. So I would say that at the overlap of the Venn diagram of uh, lexicology and philology would be etymology. Ah, I get it. Good for you, because I don't. <laughs> so a lexicographer can break down the meaning and origin of a word and yet not know anything about the history of its language. <laughs> That's unkind. Not entirely true. How not? The thigh bone is connected to the shin bone and so on. <laughs> what? You know, I actually get that really weird analogy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, P with an A, let's get to why we're here. First, Linda Rutledge. Hmm. The book sounds great. It is. And... You know, all that stuff you said and the passage from her reading, I want to read that book at once. You should. And the, But the print edition is not available in India, is it? I checked with two bookstores. Um, no, it wasn't. Ah, but you said um, we have a link in the podcast description. Mm -hmm. So to where? To Kindle. You know, it's on that Kindle subscription thing. You know, where you pay a monthly fee and you can read a selection of books for it? Uh, Kindle Unlimited. That's the one. Ah, and what do you think of Kindle Unlimited? Uh, they never have any recent releases, you know. So, or any, for that matter, any of the books that I want to read, except this one. I was delighted I found West with Giraffes there. I'm getting my copy there then. You go ahead and do that. All right, P with an A. The reason we are here today, what's that word? Didn't you tell me that we have a guest on the show? We do. Linda. Hmm. And this is Linda with an I, not Linda with a Y, as in the author. Right. And she's from New York, and she's mm -hmm. presently in Bangalore, and she has read West with Giraffes. That's cool. All right, let's get her on. What are you going to do? Are you going to call her? Even better. She's in the studio with us. Cool. And I'm patching her through to live. Give me a moment, please. Mm -hmm. Hello, Linda. Welcome to the Literary City and to What's That Word? Hey, Linda. Hi, Ramji. Hey, Pranati. Thanks so much for having me over. Oh, it's our pleasure. So, Linda, I know you haven't listened to the interview with Linda Rutledge, but I understand that you have read West with Giraffes. Yes. Uh, the most delightful book that I came across. I loved it. Um, there's something very nostalgic. Uh, it takes you through these, this era that it's just everything seemed so grimy and dusty, but there was so much hope in the horizon and just earnestness. I loved it. And how did you find the book? Um, on the, While I was browsing Kindle Unlimited 
to find what I could read next. And I, I, I was just thinking about that book for the longest time after I finished it. One of the reasons why I loved it is the love between this giraffe and this, this guy. And it just got me. Cool. You know, you're the second person in this interview to say that you found this book on while browsing Kindle. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, that the other one was me. <laughs> oh. <All right>. <laughs> hey, okay, great. So you said that you had a phrase that you wanted to discuss with us today. What is it? What's yes. that word? You know, talking about Americano, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of phrases that I was hearing in New York when I was living there. Mm -hmm. One thing that really caught my fancy was uh, two shakes of a rat's tail. Two shakes of a rat's you know. tail? Okay. <laughs> I... Yeah. How interesting is that? I know. I haven't <laughs> heard it before. Ramji, do you know uh, this one? Hey, as a matter of fact, I do. You know, I came across this phrase a couple of months ago in an online magazine, and I looked it up. And... Linda, let's get back to you for a second. Yeah. How did you come across this phrase? Um, very recently, actually, I found a movie on Netflix, as one does, and it was about a singing crocodile, mm. as all movies are about. <laughs> it's called Lyle Lyle Crocodile. There's this character in the show, which is colorful, loud, who talks to the singing crocodile and says, you know, I'll be back kind of thing. But he goes in two shakes of a rat's tail. And that's just <laughs> so cute. Uh, but I, I don't know if it's got something to do with, do you know how New York has such a big rat problem? And you have the New York subway rat. The one with the pizza? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the pizza rat. Uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly the one that carries that slice of pizza yes, across and, the stairs and stuff like well, that. There was this video of this rat carrying the slice of pizza, an actual rat. And there's this other video of this guy dressed as a rat ca uh -huh. carrying this massive piece of pizza in his mouth up the stairs, you know. Ha! <laughs> huh. And here I thought I was being subtle when I was doing it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, Ramji, hmm? over to you. Tell us about the origin of this phrase. Sure. All right. So, here it is. The phrase that I read, which is the original phrase, actually is... Two shakes of a lamb's tail, ah. right? And it basically means it's a very short amount of time. So the phrase refers to the speed with which a lamb can move its tail, you know, which is quite fast. And apparently a lamb can shake its tail twice instantly. Oh, wow. Exactly. This phrase is believed to have originated in the U.S. in the early 19th century. The first recorded usage was in 1840 in... Uh, this uh, book by uh, Richard Barham. And the book is called The Ingoldsby Legends, which is a collection of myths and legends and ghost stories and poems. And right. And how did that author use the phrase? Oh, yeah, I have that. I have the reference, actually. Here's how. There's a story in the book. It's called The uh, Leech of Folkestone. And the phrase is used in the following lines. And let me read it out. That's all, your reverence. We must be jogging. Time flies, you know. Tis a goodish step to noggin. Cross at this ferry and then, two shakes of a lamb's tail, we're there. <laughs> I love old English. And mm. so if he used it in a book, then the phrase must have been mm -hmm. quite well known. Yeah, the phrase is probably older. Oh, and is the phrase still in use? No, I don't think it is any anymore in use. Ah, why not? Uh... Because lambs aren't as visible in urban society as they were in the agrarian <laughs> 19th century, I guess. So, Ramji, uh, hmm? where else has this come up before? Where else has this phrase come up before? Well, two shakes, you know, as a recognized unit of time, right? Wait, two shakes is a recognized unit of time? <laughs> yes, it is. It appears in an ad, you know, in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania Gazette Times in 1920, and the ad read, replenishing your wardrobe may take even less time than two shakes of a lamb's tail. Ah. So is that why it's called two shakes of a rat's tail? Is that how it became that, like Linda originally asked? Yeah, Linda did ask that. Well, all right, weirdly, I could not find any etymology of, uh, of that phrase at all, two shakes of a rat's tail. So I've come to the conclusion that it must have been a made-up phrase of of some sort. So I looked everywhere, but I did read one article that mentioned the phrase. And uh, Linda, where did you say you heard that before? This was in the movie? 
uh, called Lyle Lyle Crocodile. Is that a children's movie? Um, no, we're not. You are not making judgments here now, are we? Because I, <laughs> I watched it. <laughs> Let's, let's not get judgmental here now. <laughs> That's okay. But speaking of children, yeah. I found an X, Xbox game reference. Apparently, two shakes of a rat's tail appears in an Xbox game. I couldn't find the name of the game, but it does. But I did find a children's book by that name online. Two shakes of a rat's tail. $73. Oh, that sounds cute. $73 for a children's book. Uh, mm -hmm. No thanks. Well, they have a flip book version online and I read it. It's about rats that mutate. Very depressing. Oh, good gosh. Wait. <laughs> it costs $73 and they have a free yes. online version. And they wonder why their business plan doesn't work. <laughs> it must be one of those thick books, right? Each page being like a solid <laughs> slate of something. You know how long it took me to read it? Oh. Let me guess. Two shakes of a rat stain. Of a rat stain. <laughs> <laughs> so come back to how it was used as a unit of time. Explain that. Okay. You know, this is actually a serious tech phrase. So let's, you know, it, it got called the shake and S-H-A-K-E actually received a specific time value in the mid-1940s. And that would be 100 years after Barham used it in, in his book. So this was in the Manhattan Project. You know, the Manhattan Project is where they developed and designed and built the atom bomb. Right. And the designers were, sh well, you know, they were looking for a phrase to describe a time unit to express the timing of uh, different events in a nuclear reaction. So they came upon shake as an informal unit of time equal to 10 nanoseconds. And as you know, a nanosecond is a billionth of one second. Okay. So it, you know, it, takes, uh, it takes one shake, which is 10 nanoseconds, to, for each neutron to cause a fission event in a nuclear reaction. And then when you gather about 50 to 100 of those shakes, kablooey. Ow. So even today, the word shake is actually used in high tech and it's used in, you know, integrated circuit design it makes our cell phones go faster. So do you have any more stuff on it? Yes, I have the corollary. Oh, the opposite of two shakes? Yeah. What's, well, okay. here it is. Mm. Two shakes of a dead lamb's tail. That's the corollary. Mm. And this means a dead lamb does not shake its right. tail and therefore it denotes that nothing happens. Right. Mm. Happily, this is all hypothetical. Well, yes, it is. We're not actually talking about dead lambs. And, and the lamb is such a peaceable animal, right? How does it make its way into nuclear and nuclear fission, I wonder? <laughs> anyway, so Linda, did we answer your questions? Did we rise to the occasion? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Thank cool. you very much. Cool. So, Linda, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. And will you come back on the show next time? Oh, I'd love to. Another interesting work. This sounds so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And thanks for the etymology, Ramji. And as for me, I'm out of here. In... Don't you dare say it. <laughs> I won't. Bye. <laughs> And that is our show. I'd like to thank my guests, Linda Rutledge, Linda Pershad, and my co-host, Pranathi P with an A, Mother. And you, for being here and for listening. And before you go, hit that subscribe button. Get notified every time we have a new episode up. Well, have a fun time. See you again soon.